Well, good morning, and it is good to be able to come and worship the Lord, and it's good to have God in our lives, and I just pray that you, this month, and as the months come our way, that you would just surrender your life and the things that you're doing to Him. Uh, just always making Him leader of your life and ready to receive all that God has for you. I just wonder, you know anybody who ever gets a little irritated? Anybody who gets upset, maybe a little angry, irritated, annoyed, right? I saw hands going up, right? That's, that's kind of all of us, right? Some of us this morning, some of us on the way to church, irritated, frustrated, aggravated, and that probably, not probably, that happens to, to all of us. But I think all of us would also say, I'd just rather not go there. I'd rather not have those things come up and be a part of my life. I'd really, what I really want is to have the freedom to enjoy all the blessings and favor that God has for me and my family and his church. And I would, what I really want would be those things, not the irritations and the aggravations and the frustrations and the bitterness and the resentment, but I would want to receive all that God has for me and then share, share those blessings, share that generosity, share that goodness with others. Isn't that what... Isn't that what you want? It's what I want. I was thinking about that when it comes to movies. Uh, you look at movies and usually there's a character in the movie and if they want something, right, they're, they're wanting something in this movie, a lot of times they sing about what they want. And uh, you may have already thought about some movies where there's the main character sings about something that they would like to have. I immediately thought of Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, right? She, she sings uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow because she's wanting an adventure. And so she sings about that, and of course she gets, she gets the adventure. I thought about, of course, uh, our favorite movie or the movie that we have to watch over and over and over is the Frozen movie. And in that, uh, Anna... She, she sings a song about how she wants her uh, sister to help her build a snowman, right? And so that's what she wants. She wants some playtime with her sister, and so she sings about that in the song and in the movie. Um, another movie, just one more, and I, I bring this one up for my, for my mom. It's an Elvis movie, Blue Hawaii. And Elvis sings his signature song in that, uh, in that movie, I Can't Help Falling in Love with You. And of course, he wants to keep his girlfriend, right, in that movie. And so they sing about what they want. And I wonder, if you had a song, what would that song be? Would it be a song where you would say, you know what, I do want the blessings and the favor of God. I want to receive His goodness, His grace. I want to know God, experience what God has for me, the love, the joy, the peace in my life. I want to, to receive all of those things, and I want to share that with others. I'd say that's probably the majority of us would say, you know what, that's a song worth singing. On this 4th of July weekend, we celebrate freedom the freedom to come and worship and to live our lives by this book. And so we celebrate that freedom uh, today and every day. Every 4th of July, Americans celebrate the freedoms of blessing that we enjoy as a nation. The founders of our country recognize that freedom, it's a gift from God, and they even they write that when they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness. The American ideal of freedom definitely flows from this biblical worldview. And the Bible has lots and lots to say about freedom. One of the most important aspects of freedom is knowing that your sins have been forgiven. That we don't have to live a life of wonder or doubt, uh, angry, irritated, bitter, resentful. We don't have to live that life. When we receive the forgiveness of Jesus, putting our faith in Him, surrendering our life to Him, making Him leader of our life, then we can receive, really, what God has for us. And then again, we can share that with other people. So today, I want to talk about forgiveness. Now, I know over the past few weeks, we've talked a little bit about how we can say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, help me to do better, right? We've kind of talked about that, but we really haven't talked about, what about forgiving other people? And so... That's what I want to deal with today, is this forgiving other people. Jesus said in John chapter 8, If you're my disciples, and you know my truth, then that truth will set you free. He also was talking in Luke chapter 4, that passage that I, the, our call to worship passage this morning, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, and just a reminder there, Jesus said that he was anointed to do five things. Five things that he was anointed to do. And he says there, he says, I, I'm anointed to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recover the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Five of those things. And so Jesus is saying, he's the one who brings freedom. He's the only one that can bring freedom in your life because he's the only one who can forgive you of your wrongdoings when you come up short the sins, the bitterness, the resentment, the anger, all of those things, Jesus is the one who can bring freedom. When Jesus was asked to pray, Matthew records that in Matthew chapter 6, and in that Lord's Prayer in verse 9, Jesus talks about forgiveness. And he says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I know that verse, just saying that verse, uh, sometimes that verse 9, we, we say it in a little different ways. It's inter sometimes people, they get to that verse 9 and they just kind of hold their breath because they don't know whether to say, forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our trespasses, or forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? We can thank Tyndale for, uh, for those uh, tr different words that are translated there, but really, we're talking about the same thing. Sin, trespasses, debts. Sin just simply means to miss the mark. I've said before, it's an archery term. You're trying to hit the bullseye, a perfect shot, and you shoot, and it doesn't matter if you're off just a hair or if you miss the whole board. You still miss the mark, and the Bible calls that sin. Just a little bit, or a whole bunch, it's sin. And then trespass just means you're in a spot that you're not supposed to be. <laughs> you're somewhere where you ought not to be. You're looking at something that you're not supposed to be looking at. You're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. You're trespassing. Same thing. That separates you from God. And then debts. You've received something, but now you owe something. It's time for payment. You've received it, now it's time to pay that up. And when Jesus says, forgive us our debts, he's really saying that, that we all have this debt to pay because 
We've all sinned. And sin, sin damages people, sin damages relationships, sin just does all kinds of uh, just trouble, problems. And so there's a penalty, there's something that has to be paid because of that sin. Romans 6.23 says, and the wages of sin is death. And so that's a big payment. Nobody wants to make that payment, right? The wages of sin is death. Thankfully, that verse goes on to say right after that, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so that's where we get to, is Jesus is the one who forgives, and he is the one who can bring freedom. Jesus forgives, and he wants you to pray that prayer of forgiveness and to receive for yourself that forgiveness, to become a child of God. Right? We've talked a lot about confession over the past month or two, that you confess that to God, and God is quick to forgive. And so you confess and through faith in Christ that you believe that He went to the cross and died for your sin, and He rose three days later to conquer death. He has victory over the grave and over sin, and so we celebrate that. Jesus forgives, and he also redeems. That word redemption, it's a powerful word that describes our freedom from the guilt and the shame that we have of our sin. Redemption describes our freedom from guilt, and also redemption takes away the power of sin in our lives. Sin no longer holds a grip when you've been redeemed. Redemption means to liberate, to free, to deliver, to exchange, to convert, to buy back. We say that a lot of times, right? Jesus, what the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, he, he, he bought you back. And it came with a great price. But we're not able to buy that back. We can't, we can't forgive ourselves. We can't redeem ourselves. We can't do that on our own. But in Christ, Paul would say, in Christ you are forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. And so this is really where I want to spend the rest of our time. I said all of that to say this. To experience freedom, to enjoy the blessings and the favor of God, to enjoy the hope, love, peace that God has for you, you have to be forgiven. And we know that Jesus Christ is the only one who is able to forgive and to cleanse and to wipe that away. And then once you do that, and this is where I want to go with the, with the rest of our time, is we have to forgive other people. If you've received God's forgiveness for your life, He calls you to forgive others. And so the question is why, and so that's, why, that's all I want to look at for the rest of our time is why. Why should you forgive? And really, it's a good question. Why should you forgive other people? And the first thing is, it's already what I've been talking about. Why should you forgive? Because God has forgiven you. Okay? Simple enough. That's what we've been talking about. You should forgive other people because God has forgiven you. When I realize how much God has forgiven me, and it's a lot... <laughs> It makes me want to be quick to forgive other people. But now, that's not always the case. Just because God has forgiven somebody doesn't mean that they're going to be quick to forgive. In fact, Jesus told a parable about that in Matthew 18 about the unmerciful servant. Some of you remember that parable that, that Jesus told. It's found in, 
in uh, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to spend some time there, Matthew chapter 18. But Jesus tells this parable after Peter comes and asks a question. And he asks a really good question. In verse 21, it says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And so, great question. Peter just said, hey, I mean, how many times do I have to forgive these people? I mean, they kept, do, they kept doing me wrong. They're talking about me behind my back. They're lying. They're, still, they're just doing all... How many times do I have to forgive somebody? And Peter says, seven times? And it's great because I think Peter really thought that he was really going to wow Jesus. I, really, I think Peter thought that Jesus was going to say, Wow, Peter, man, you have such compassion. You have such mercy. You're so kind and generous. Seven times, Peter. And I, I think that because in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, Peter was thinking, you really just have to forgive somebody twice. Right? They hit you on this side. That's one. And then you turn the cheek, and they hit you on the other side, and I'm counting, I'm keeping track, that's two. But after that, it's on. I mean, it's two times, and that's it. We're time to take it outside, time to take it out on the street, and settle this, the gloves come off. And so Peter was thinking, hey, I'm going above and beyond just two times. I'm going to forgive somebody seven times. And Jesus says after that, verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And I hate to do the math because I mess it up all the time, but that is 490 times. But Jesus is not talking about 490 times you have to keep track. He's talking about an infinite number of times that you have to forgive over and over and over. This parable that Jesus tells here kind of explains that. Again, it's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And you may know that story. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus tells the story and he says, you know, <clears throat> there was this boss man and he's settling his accounts. He's seeing how much he has and who owes him what. And he comes across this guy that uh, owes him a bunch of money. One translation says that it's $10 million. This guy owes the boss man $10 million. And so the boss man goes and he sends some people to have this guy come to his office. And so they bring him to his office and the boss man says, Hey, you owe me $10 million bucks. I want it. And the guy says, I don't have it. Give me some time. <laughs> like time's going <laughs> to, he's going to be able to come up with 10 million bucks uh, in some time. And, and he says, no. He said, I want it. You don't have it. So now I'm going to sell your, your, your wife and your kids and I'm going to get some of this money back. That's how things, that's how things went. And scripture says that the guy pleaded with him. He says, be patient with me. And he begged, begged him to give him some time. And scripture says that the, the big boss man took pity on him and he canceled the debt, all of his debt, $10 million, just canceled it and he let the guy go. I mean, wow, <laughs> right? And so what happens next, Jesus said, that guy leaves the big boss man's office he goes down the road and he runs into somebody who owes him $2,000. Now, 2000 bucks that's not chump change, but $10 million he just got forgiven. And now he sees somebody that owes him 2000 bucks, and so he stops the guy and he says, Hey, you owe me $2,000, I want it and I want it now. And the guy says, he says the same things that he said. He said, Have pity on me. Give me some time. And the guy says, nope, not going to give you time. And he says, have his family, his wife, kids, have them thrown into prison. I want my money. 
And some other people saw what had just happened. They saw that this guy had just been forgiven this huge amount of debt. And then he goes after somebody that owed him just a little bit. And so they're outraged and they're mad. And they go tell the big boss man what happened. And this is how Jesus finishes, starting at verse 32. It says, Then the, the big boss man, the master, called the servant in, and he said, You wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? What would you say? Yeah, right? And he says, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. So now he owes 10 million bucks again. And Jesus finishes in verse 35 and he says, This is how my heavenly Father will treat you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother or sister, from your heart. There's our word again, heart, that we've been looking at for over a month now. Heart. It comes from the heart. And a lot of times we don't feel like forgiving people, but it's a choice that we make because God has forgiven you and so we choose to forgive other people. We should forgive because God has forgiven us. The problem with that sometimes is people don't really feel forgiven, right? People don't really feel forgiven. They don't believe maybe that Jesus can really wipe away all of the mess and the junk and the trouble. And so they don't feel forgiven and they don't want anybody else to feel forgiven. Well, I don't feel like I've, my slate has been wiped clean, so I don't want anybody else's slate to be wiped clean. Sometimes people don't feel forgiven because they don't think they've done anything wrong. I've talked to people and sometimes people will start out and say, I've been a Christian all my life. <laughs> and, and usually... Not always, but sometimes they go on and you have this conversation and it's almost like they've never done anything wrong. Their whole life, innocent. Been a Christian my whole life. Haven't really done anything bad. And, and that may be the case, and that's, and that's good. I mean, if you've, if you've lived your whole life and you've been a Christian most of your life and, and you haven't done anything you know, terrible and awful and... And that's good. But a lot of people will take that a step further and they will just really focus on this innocence. I'm innocent. I haven't done anything bad, especially compared to all you people out there. Oh man, this guy's bad. And compared to this person over here and this woman and this guy and this gal, man, I haven't done anything. I really am innocent. And people can take that so far as to come to the conclusion of, I'm really pretty good, and I really don't need God's forgiveness. All right? I mean, I'm okay. I know a lot of people that's not okay, but me, I'm okay. And I thought about that, of how we have a tendency to want to maintain our innocence. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. I shouldn't be punished. I hear that from our kids all the time. I didn't do it. It's not my fault. I shouldn't be in trouble. And I thought about that this week with the kids and um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> Because this past week, I noticed that I was defending my actions. And I was wanting to be the one who everybody knew was innocent. And so, I see where they get that. They get that from me. 
this past week, Bella had a birthday this week, and my mom, she calls in the, in the <clears throat> early part of the week, and she said, hey, uh, I want to surprise Bella with some meatloaf cupcakes. And I know you have no idea what a meatloaf cupcake is, but I'll just tell you just real short, here's what it is. It's a giant meatball with mashed potatoes on top of it, and she colors the mashed potatoes, puts a color on it to make it look like a cupcake, okay? So that's what a meatball cupcake is, and she called and she's wanting to bring Bella a surprise meatball cupcakes. Now our young boys, they just want cupcakes, right? They want the sugar. They don't care about the beef and the mashed potatoes, but dad cares about that because we've been eating chicken for about a month because the last time I tried to buy beef, I thought, man, I'm going to have to take out a loan just to buy some beef, right? And so when she says she's going to bring some beef over to the house, I thought, bring it on, okay? So she said, I'm going to bring that at noon on Friday, and we're going to have lunch, and we're going to surprise Bella. Don't tell Bella anything about it. Well, I thought, okay, sounds great, sounds wonderful. Friday morning comes, my sister, Sherry, calls me up and says, hey, we're going boat riding, and we want to take Bella with us for the day. And I thought, uh-oh, there's a problem. Mom's coming up here to surprise Bella at noon, and she's going to be out on a boat. I'm not going to get in trouble. And I said, hey, you need to smooth that over with Mom and make sure that that's okay. So she said, all right, I'll handle it. So I I, I uh, end, the, end the call, and I start doing my own business. I just start carrying on the day, and 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, noon rolls around, and guess who shows up at my door at noon carrying meatloaf cupcakes? And as soon as she walked in the door, I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. She's coming to surprise Bella, and Bella's out on the boat. And so as soon as she comes in, I let it be known. Hey, it's not my fault. Bella's not here. I throw my sister under the bus. I said, she came. She took her. They're in a boat. Don't know why they're in a boat. Don't know when they're going to come back. I don't even know why they're on a boat. It's 100 degrees outside. Why would anybody want to be in a boat, right? And so I go on and on because I don't want to get in trouble. I didn't do anything bad. I still want to be the favorite son, right? And so I go to great lengths to defend something that I really didn't need to defend. I'm really not that innocent, by the way. But she stopped me and she said, hey, your sister's got it all taken care of. She said, I just wanted to bring you guys some lunch so you can have lunch. And then when Bella gets back, then she said, I made extra and we're gonna have lunch down there. She said, everything's fine, everything's fine. But a lot of times we're quick to, to make sure that we look innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything bad. It's not my fault. I just really wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting into trouble. And if we tell ourselves that long enough, that I'm innocent, I haven't done anything wrong. We tell ourselves that long enough, we'll start to believe, and this is the point that I'm trying to make through all of that story. If we keep telling ourselves that long enough, then we won't believe that we need God's forgiveness. That we will go about our lives and we'll say, I'm good, I'm okay. God, I, I know you offer forgiveness, but I don't need it because I'm okay. And yet the Bible says, again, you miss the mark. It doesn't matter if you miss it just a little, little bit. You've still missed the mark. There's, you still have a debt to pay. There's still trespasses that you go, places where you ought not to be. And the Bible calls that sin. And that sin, big or small, needs to be forgiven and confessed and turned over to God. And God says that, that we all owe this debt. And we, it's unpayable. You can't pay it without Jesus. I can't pay it. It's an unpayable debt. Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, He said, The one who has been forgiven much loves much. But the one who has been forgiven little, well, they love little. 
And so I don't want to, to think that, oh, the stuff that I've done or the stuff that I do, is that's just little stuff. That's just little stuff. It was the little stuff and the big stuff that sent Jesus to the cross. And so I always think of, you know, that's big stuff. I have been forgiven much, and, you know, I can just, I can count the times. I've been forgiven much. I want to love much, and I want to forgive others as quickly as I can. The second reason that we should forgive others is because bitterness will take root and it will ruin your life. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because if you've ever had unforgiveness, you know that how unhealthy that is. Bitterness will just ruin you, make you sick. It's just uh, like little daggers in your stomach all day long, no rest, can't sleep, always thinking about it. And it always causes, bitterness and resentment always causes you a whole lot more pain than it does the other person. Always. Always, always, always. You will never be totally free from that pain unless you forgive. As the saying goes, it's like, it's like uh, you swallowing poison and you expect the other person to die. It just doesn't, you will always come out on the short end of that. You will always be hurt worse than the person you are not forgiving. When you choose not to forgive, you don't have the freedom that God wants you to enjoy. When you choose not to forgive, you have to kind of keep track of all of that, right? You have to keep track of why, what's the reason, why am I not talking to this person, why am I avoiding this person, why am I uncomfortable when this person's name is mentioned? And you have to kind of keep track of all of that, and it becomes a burden. That bitterness and that resentment. When you choose not to forgive, you're really robbed of all the things that God has for you. And you can't experience those things because... There's bitterness and there's resentment. And it can ruin your life. And I think we understand that. And again, I'm not going to go into to all of that because I think we've felt that before from time to time. And we understand how real that is. So the last thing, and we'll kind of close with this one, why you need to forgive somebody else is because there's going to be a time when you need to be forgiven. It's a two-way street. When you forgive other people and then you do something stupid, then they will forgive you. It goes both ways. We can't receive what we're unwilling to give, right? We can't receive what we're unwilling to give to other people. Matthew 6, that's really the go-to verse when you're trying to convince somebody or motivate somebody to forgive someone. Matthew 6, that's the verse. And it's plain, and it's simple, and it might cause you to say, ouch, when you read that. But Matthew 6, again, and this is, that's where we find the Lord's Prayer. I don't know if you realize that or not, but at the very end of the Lord's Prayer, this is what Jesus says. Matthew 6, and Jesus says, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So that's good. Forgive others, God's going to forgive you. And then Jesus goes on and he says, but, but if you do not forgive others their sins, then your heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. And I don't even have to go in and talk about that. That's straightforward. Not my words. Those are the words written in red. Those are the words of Christ. James chapter 2 James chapter 2, you read through chapter 2, and James is talking about judgment. And really, James chapter 2 is what the world needs to, to read today. Because James says that if you choose not to show mercy to people, then mercy will not be shown to you. Right? 
you don't show any grace, you don't show any mercy, then it's not going to be shown to you at judgment time. That's what James is talking about. Again, thankfully, James goes on and he says that mercy always triumphs over judgment. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. That if you become a giver of grace to people and you're forgiving others, that one day when you stand before Jesus, then the grace of Christ will cover you. That, that Jesus will be enough. If you've confessed, received forgiveness, by faith in Christ believe that He died and took your sins and cleansed you from all unrighteousness, then at that time when you're face to face with Jesus, you're going to be covered. Covered by the grace of of Christ. Now, I know in uh, about 40 minutes, um, in a 40-minute message, there's absolutely no way to cover everything about forgiveness. Uh, it's just impossible to do that, and I don't want you guys to leave here today and, uh, and, and, and think that I've come across in a way that makes forgiveness sound easy that, oh, pastor said just forgive, no problem, everything will be fine, I've been hurt, I've been abused, I've been in pain, and, and uh, he just says, just, you need to just deal with it. You just need to forgive and get over it. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that the pain and the hurt caused by other people to you or to your family, to the people that you love, is easy. Uh, because it's not. And I don't know, you may be a little bit like me. People, people might be able to mess with you and uh, do stuff to you, and it kind of just rolls off or bounces off, and you can take it. I mean, you, you've lived long enough to where you can forgive some people and you can just kind of let that go. But what happens... When somebody's mean to your kids or your grandkids, somebody says something to them or is mean to them or hits them or abuses them, oh, it's on now, right? You mess with me, don't mess with my family, right? And so I have to go back to Matthew 6 and I have to read that and say, I need to forgive. God has forgiven me. Unforgiveness is just going to bring me pain. But I understand. And, and, and everybody's pain and hurt is different levels. And you may have been hurt deeply by somebody. Pain goes deep. Hurt goes deep. And I would just say that God sees all of that pain and all of that hurt. And He just asks you to trust in Him. To trust that that Jesus is enough for your life, that He will take care of that pain and that hurt, and that His forgiveness to you will be enough so that with God's help, you will be able to forgive others. So forgiveness doesn't mean that we totally forget the offense. I'm not saying that you just pretend that nothing happened. Oh, everything's fine. It didn't happen. I'm not saying that at all. We don't forget the pain and the hurt. And forgiveness doesn't mean that everything will just go back to normal. Oh, you just forgive him and everything will be, will be fine. I'm not saying that either. You don't have to forgive somebody and then take them out to lunch and be best buddies and be best friends. You're probably not going to be. So things don't always go back to normal. And forgiveness doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some sort of consequences involved for them. You don't just say, oh, I forgive you, and then, it, then they're off scot-free. Nothing happens. No big deal. Life moves on. A lot of times, somebody does something wrong, and they hurt you, and they cause pain to you or your family. There's some consequences that come into play, and that's okay. Forgiveness means I'm going to do my part. And I'm going to ask God to release me of that unforgiveness so that I can release other people from that. 
The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, and I'll close with this, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, it says there's, there's a time, right? There's a time for everything. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to grieve. But then he says there's also, there comes a time to heal. And so in order to get to that place of healing, there needs to be forgiveness. And the only way that you can be whole, have a whole heart, to have a right relationship with God is for you to be forgiven and to ask Jesus to forgive you. And the only way that you can be wholehearted and healthy and healed is for you to forgive those people who have harmed you. And that's really what will bring us true freedom. Forgiveness from God so that we can be a child of God and in right relationship with Him, but also free other people up so that you can enjoy all the blessings and the favor that God has for you. And then you can share those blessings and favor with the people around you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this great gift of forgiveness. And I just ask that uh, if there's somebody who haven't, they just haven't come to the place where they've asked for you to forgive them, I ask that this would be the day that they would receive your forgiveness and be made right in the sight of God. And, and if there's any any bitterness or unforgiveness in our hearts, I just ask that you help us to examine that and that you help us to extend that same freedom, that same forgiveness that you give us. Father, we love you. We ask that you have your way in everything that we say and do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.